and I'm gonna introduce Netanel Rubin. He has been here last year with a talk that he got some bashing for. This year, he's gonna ensure it's not the programmer's fault, it's the language itself. No? Well, here we go. Well, here we go. Netanel, he's working for Parameter X in Tel Aviv. Welcome on stage, your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Last year, I stood right on this very stage and I talked about several of Perl's less thought out features. Now, I got some passion from the Perl community, but mainly what happened was that the Perl community completely rejected my talk, claiming that the, that the language is completely fine and great, and all of those stuff are just improvements. It was clear I had to give another talk. <laughs> this is why I am very proud to present Pearl Jam 2, The Camel Strikes Back. <laughs> Thank you. At the last talk, I showed that lists are expressions used in many confusing ways. I also showed how CGI parameters can create lists directly from user input. But most importantly, I showed that when these two things combine, shit happens. Great. But the real interesting part was the Pearl Monk's response. The Pearl community The Perl community had a long discussion at the Perl Monks Forum that started with the words, sad news from Germany. <laughs> a bit dramatic, but who am I to judge? So after a long, long discussion, they came to the unavoidable conclusion that my talk was, in fact, a polemic shit, <laughs> and they should all just piss on it, <laughs> wink. They also realized I'm just a script kitty preaching to other script kitties. And not just any script kitties, the CCC audience is a heterogeneous group of chaotic punks <laughs> who love to see themselves in the hacker image of Hollywood media. <laughs> what hacker image? What are they talking about? We have no hacker image. Anyway, it got quite surreal as in some point they even criticized the crude use of propaganda in the camel images. <laughs> what? <laughs> mm. Propaganda in the camel images. All right. Anyway, they completely rejected the entire talk, even though the technical points were valid. They rejected it because of some jokes and camel images. But still, they got so offended, they just threw lame excuses as to why their language suck. A repeated, the, the, two of these lame excuses were repeated over and over again. The first, was that I should read the fucking manual. Which is funny because I thought I was the only one who did. <laughs> and the second is that I'm using the old ancient pearl and not the new modern pearl. <laughs> Remember these two points carefully as I <laughs> later break them in the presentation. But enough with the intro. Let's start with the new madness. So, Perl allows declaring variables without specifying their data type. Of course, this functionality exists in many dynamic languages and is completely fine and very convenient. But, as usual, 
Pearl took it to a whole different level. Pearl went as far as removing data type declarations from function arguments. You can see that in this example, I'm just receiving two different arguments without knowing what type there are. Let me be clear about that. You don't get to choose whether you want to specify argument data types or not. You can't specify what data types you're expecting to get. So even if I build a function that only works with strings, I have no way of forcing that at the function declaration. Now that's annoying. But the real kicker is how this feature is used. Apparently, it is very common to write two completely different blocks of code, one that handles scalar types, like strings or ints, and one that handles non-scalar types, like arrays or hashes. Let me repeat that. Writing multiple code for multiple data, data types in one function is a Perl standard, and that's sad. You shouldn't write redundant code because the language lacks the capability of letting you decide which cases you don't want to handle. By the way, Python doesn't let you declare your function argument data types too, but unlike Perl, writing redundant code to cover that up is definitely not the standard. Anyway, sad as this may be, this Perl convention is not dangerous. The dangerous part begins when hashes and arrays are considered as secure data types, mainly because they can't be created by user input. This results in this kind of code, where if the function argument is a hash, for example, it is used unescaped in dangerous functions. Hashes, specifically, are considered so secure that even if you use taint mode, which is some kind of safe mode for Perl, hash keys are not tainted, meaning that even if you use that safe mode, they can be still used in dangerous functions without any validation, as opposed to other data types. Now, this kind of code appears a lot in Perl applications, and apart from the many bugs this method can cause, it also makes your code exploitable. So we know function arguments are of unknown data type. And we know developers treat hashes and arrays as secure data types, inserting their values into dangerous functions. But these practices isn't something that was created a long time ago and found only on redundant code. Because of how the language is built, it's supposedly restrictionless type of developing. Even now, it is the natural way to code when you're using Perl. And that's the real problem. Perl is like a shotgun with one trigger you know about and a dozen that you don't. So for now, we know that if we'll somehow manage to create these secure data types with our user input, we could exploit the code. So the only question remaining, really, is what are we going to exploit? And the answer again is Bugzilla. <laughs> like every other Perl project, Bugzilla is heavily using functions that treat scalar and non-scalar argument types very differently. This is one of them. The load from DB function is responsible for extracting object-specific data out of the database. Like I just said, it treats scalars, and in this case, hashes, very differently. If the function argument is a hash, it takes one of its values and inserts it as is, unescaped, into an SQL statement. Again, because hashes are considered secure, so there's no point of escaping them. On the other hand, if the argument is a scalar, it converts it into an integer and only then use it in an SQL statement because scalar values are not secured. Hashes, secure, scalar, not secure. This means that if we could control the function argument 
entirely, including its data type, we could control the SQL query, effectively exploiting an SQL injection attack by inserting a hash containing that specific value. But CGI input doesn't allow hashes, right? The whole Perl security module is built on that assumption. The problem is that, like us, developers are assuming CGI input is the only input method available, CGI. But CGI isn't the only way to go. Bugzilla developers miss the fact that their own system is also featuring an XML RPC and a JSON RPC, both supporting input of non-scalar data types, like arrays and hashes. But I'm not blaming them. Yes, they forgot that there are more ways for a user to input than CGI, but still, they're just the product of how Perl programming is taught, filled with false assumptions and inconsistencies, expecting anything but this kind of security problems is just naive. But back to the vulnerability. If we'll use one of these RPCs, sending our input parameter with a malicious hash instead of just a regular numeric parameter, we will be able to exploit the SQL injection. So if we'll send this regular request using the JSON RPC interface, the number one will be used as the ID of a bug to extract. But if we'll send this request, where instead of an integer we'll supply a hash, then suddenly we will be able to inject any SQL we'd like into that statement, effectively compromising the entire database. Now when you look at this request, you realize that this is not a sophisticated vulnerability. All I did was just change the input data type from Scalar, in this case, to a hash. And that's it. The system is compromised. It was so heavily built on the assumption that hashes are secure that it offered me almost unlimited access security-wise. The funny thing about that is that although it's so simple, the attack has existed for over five years. That, that's the year I was born in. <laughs> so we now proved this unknown argument type feature is a huge source for problems. We also know writing different code to handle different data types just causes a lot of false assumptions. But most importantly, Treating non-scalar data types, such as hashes, as secure just because they supposedly can be created by the user is very, very bad. Just ex esk bugzilla. But the shocking part really is that, again, this is the Perl standard. You're not expected to use it. You have to, as you don't have any other choice. This security Mess is a fundamental part of the language. The problem is that creating non-scalar data types is impossible in some cases. We can't rely that some kind of RPC will exist in the code and support different data types. And we can't create data types using regular user inputs, right? Well. Let's have a look at how different CGI modules send a different kind of input. First, we'll take the most trivial scenario, a single value parameter, something that looks like this request, where the few pro full parameter is assigned a string bar. In this case, a scalar is created on all three CGI modules, which doesn't really help us, but it's pretty much what we've expected. It is secure. But what happens? If instead of sending a single-valued parameter, we'll send a multi-valued parameter, like in this request. Now things are starting to get complicated. On CGIPM, as we already know, a list is created, which is very useful for us, but not what we're after. Let's have a look at what the new Perl modules are creating. We'll see that both of them are returning 
arrays containing our values. Arrays. What? <laughs> I thought you can't create this kind of data types with regular input. After all, they're considered safe. But let's continue. What happens if instead of sending a regular value, we'll try and upload a file in that parameter? Now things are really getting out of hand because CGIPM now returns a file descriptor and Catalyst and Modulicious returns a hash. What? <laughs> we just exploited the most popular Perl project in the world because they assumed hashes can't be created by the user. And now we're finding out that not only we can create hashes, it is a goddamn feature? That's insane. The whole Perl security standard is built on that assumption that user can't create non-scalar data types. And now suddenly these are features. But let's send a multi-file upload request, as in several files in the same parameter. Watch closely, because this is where it gets ridiculous. Now, CGIPM returns a list of file descriptors, Catalyst returns a list of hashes, and Modulicious returns an array of objects. <laughs> what? Almost any Perl project in the world uses one of these modules for parsing CGI input. Just think how many developers assumed the exact same thing Bugzilla assumed and treated hashes and arrays as secure data types. So if you're using CGI PM, instead of the expected scalar value, you could be getting a list, a file descriptor, or a list of file descriptors, and if you're using Catalyst, you could receive a scalar, an array, a hash, or a list, which is basically any data type. <laughs> so expecting your function, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so expecting your function argument to be of a specific data type is false. Expecting hashes and arrays to be secure is also false. Expecting scalar-only user input is a major false. And to be honest, it seems that in Perl, expecting is false. <laughs> You just can't expect anything. Even the most basic of things, such as what data type your variable is made of, you just don't know. But I felt all of these points will go unnoticed without an extreme example of Pearl's absurdity. So, I found an extreme example, one that will clearly show the ridiculous nature of the language. And this is it. All this code does is print an uploaded file's content. And to show you how basic and simple that code is, I'll explain each line. The first line just creates a new CGI instance, so we could get the file from the user. The second line checks if a, if a file has been uploaded in the file parameter. The third line gets the file descriptor from the CGI module, while the fourth line loops through the file, and the fifth prints it. That's it. Again, all this code does is get a file and print it. That's it. A user has uploaded a file to the server, and the server is just returning its content. It's not saving it anywhere. It's not moving it anywhere. It just prints its content. There should be absolutely nothing dangerous in this code. 
It contains literally five lines, yet it's demo time. <laughs> so trust me, you don't need to see the text. All you need to see is that when I'm sending a regular request, nothing happens. I'm going to send it now. Nothing happens. I'm just getting the file content. We're having fun. You don't see the burp. Is it OK? No. Nice. OK. So we just, I have no idea where my mouse is. OK. So I'm sending a regular request. Nothing happens. Just getting the content. I know you can see the text. And when I'm sending my malicious request, something interesting will pop up. Watch closely. It's going to be quick. Ready? Oh, you haven't seen it. Oh, it's in the different skin. Just a second. Uh, duplicate. I'll, I'll magnify you. <laughs> All right, so watch closely. Well, whoop. What was that? <laughs> Let's see it again. Whoop. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> Just a second. Nice. So you're probably asking yourself right now, what the fuck did I just say? <laughs> Was that a terminal screen? And the answer is uh, yes, yes, <laughs> it was. Specifically, the ipconfig command output. Or in other words, what you just saw was me exploiting that five lines with a remote code execution attack. So now that you saw the magic happens, I think it's time for some explanations. The first line, responsible for checking if a file has been uploaded in the file parameter, doesn't exactly do as it says. Instead of checking if the file parameter is an uploaded file, it checks if one of its, of its values is a file descriptor. Let me clarify that. Instead of checking if the parameter is only a file, it checks if the parameter is also a file. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning that uploading a file and assigning another scalar value to the same parameter will still work and bypass that check. What? <laughs> Creative fellows, those guys, huh? So now we can assign the file parameter both a regular file and a scalar value. But what happens when we try to get the file parameter value? In a regular request, it should return the uploaded file descriptor. But now that we're adding another value to that parameter, param returns a list containing all the values we sent, the file we've uploaded and our scalar value. But the file variable can contain two values, right? So instead of converting the returned list into an array, Perl only uses the first element of that list. So if we'll send our scalar value before we send our file, the file variable will be assigned our scalar value instead of the uploaded file descriptor, which means that file is now a regular string. What? <laughs> but what happens to this operator when we use a string instead of a file descriptor? Well, the bracket operator doesn't work with strings, right? It works with file descriptors. Why should it work with strings? Well, that appears true unless that string is argv. That's not the crazy part. <laughs> In that case, the brackets operator 
listen closely, loops through the script arguments, which in CGI comes directly from the query string instead of command line, and it treats them as file paths, inserting each one into an open call. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, that made sense in some point, I guess. <laughs> so all of this basically means that now, instead of displaying our own uploaded file content, we can display the content of any file on the server. But that's not the end, as we haven't executed code yet. To execute code, we have to look at the open function. Again, this is the function being called with the argv values as file paths. Open is responsible for opening a file descriptor to a given file. Unless a pipe character is added to the end of the string, <laughs> And in that case, instead of opening the file, it executes it. <laughs> Acting as an exit call. So, we'll send our exploit containing our uploaded file, the argv malicious scalar value, and the IP config command followed by a pipe. This is what we get. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm shocked too, but I'm not done yet. <laughs> Truth be told, I didn't try that code. Remember that Poel monks told me that I should read the fucking manual? Guess where that code came from? The official CGI documentation. <laughs> but I'm not blaming CGI PM developers nor am I blaming developers who copied from CGI PM examples. After all, who could have known that this is what this code will do? This is how it could be exploited. There's no exe calls. The file is not saved anywhere, and we're only using a print. <laughs> the sole responsible for this mess is the Perl language. <laughs> Perl is the one silently expanding lists. Perl is the one mixing up your data types. Perl is the one executing user input with no exec calls. Perl is the problem, <laughs> not its developers. And until this goddamn bizarre, dangerous language is fixed, you could only Stop using Pearl. <laughs> Thank you. So I guess we have some time for questions now. <laughs> Maybe. And I have the funny feeling we will have some questions now. <laughs> okay, so we have some microphones here. Please queue up. We are not, please do not shout in because we need to record it on the stream. So, <laughs> well, here we go. Um, we also have some questions from the internet, don't we? Oh, oh yes, sure. we do. <laughs> <laughs> but before we come to the technical questions, the IRC wants you to know what you did to it. It felt like there were explosions and camels everywhere. <laughs> That's and the point. incidentally, they want to know if you have a list of those camel pics somewhere. I think Google has it. <laughs> Just search camels. <laughs> so for the first, for the first question, uh, Opello wants to know if the takeaway is that Perl project authors 
so shouldn't trust input and instead verify types with ref and always use prepared SQL statements. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. The takeaway should be <laughs> the takeaway should be that, well, how will I phrase it? I don't know. <laughs> I think I have a slide <laughs> somewhere. Oh, wait. Where's my slide? Don't worry. I have it right here. <laughs> but really, trusting user input is always a bad idea, and most developers know it. The problem is that well, at least from the code I saw written in Perl, and that's a lot of code, trust me, is that hashes and arrays are almost always considered secured as they supposedly can be created by user input, as I said. But when you're expecting your user, your, your user input to be a scalar, a string, or even a list, I don't know, and instead you get a hash from, I don't know, unexpected directions, you get confused, and you can't always live in the fear of not knowing what data type you're trying to handle. Well, not trusting scalar data types is a wise decision because it's, not, it's dangerous, but not trusting your hashes as well, not trusting your arrays, what's next? Like, not trusting your own code? You just can't expect anything to really work as it should. When you're writing Perl, you're, you're, all stans, you're constantly, constantly attacked by, by all of these different dire directions. And even the data type direction is a problem now. I hope that answered the question. Beside the slide. Well, then we're going to go over and start with number one. So thank you for opening our eyes. So even I use Perl, I would say, for cooking. And um, I remember yes. you. Sorry? I remember you from the last talk. No, no. Oh, you're new? I'm new, I'm new, I'm new. Oh, yeah. So um, I can say I'm not guilty of that, but I still would say, yes, Pearl is like cooking, uh, a bit like cooking with my mom. So um, sometimes I put something into uh, the, uh, the, the, the boiling thing, and sometimes she, sometimes I go away, sometimes she go away, and the only thing you can do is always taste. And uh, yes, you are maybe right, Pearl is a language where you never know what comes out, but it's <laughs> real cool. So if you get the right response, you can use it. <laughs> if you use it to write web applications, I would agree, web applications, a professional one at least, are not for cooking. But for doing funny things and have some fun, I think it's a perfect language. I think Perl is a lot of fun. <laughs> I completely agree on that. <laughs> then we're going to go over to two. Was your life ever threatened while interacting with the Perl community? Could you please repeat that? I <laughs> Was your life ever threatened while interacting with the Perl community? Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. I'm getting hate mail every day, <laughs> living in fear. <laughs> and over to the three, please. I think I speak for all of us, and I thank you for this wonderful talk. Oh, um, thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you, really. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Really brilliantly executed, but um, you spoke about Pearl th 5, I think. Yes, um, you're absolutely As right. some of you might know, this Christmas, <laughs> Um, so tomorrow, Ingo Blechschmidt is going to give a talk about how Perl 6 will make everything better and how everyone should start using Perl 6. And, it also um, craps rainbows. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, uh, my personal comment is wouldn't have happened with a statically typed language. So I think some nice folks at Haskell on IRC are waiting for you, Perl developers, to please come join us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Then just we're going to take the note. next one. Oh, no, sorry. You need to answer first. Why not? Uh, sorry. No, no, I, I'm not answering. I'm just, uh, just a quick note about Perl 6. This talk is all about Perl 5, all right? I, Perl 6 came out like a couple of days ago. And 
from at least from what I saw, Perl 6 is to Perl as C++ is to C. It's the same name, but it's a whole different language. So yes, this is Perl 5. Maybe I'll come back next year about Perl 6. <laughs> Who knows? I'm looking forward to that already. <laughs> Yeah, Jürd wants to know. Um, of course, you talked a lot about CGI PM, which you knew was removed from uh, the repository from Perl even before your talk last year. So what about the, its replacements from CPAN, like CGI Simple? Uh, I don't know. I haven't checked it. When I decided on which modules to check, I took CGI PM because even though it is old, it is the most popular in the world as of today. And I took Modulicious and, Cat and Catal Catalyst because they were uh, really popular too. So I didn't take the newest modules, I take the most popular modules. And I think that's the important aspect of deciding. And over to one, please. Hi. Um, part of the Perth community. And <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Uh, but I just start with Pearl 5. And oh. mm. <laughs> Didn't you? Uh. <laughs> we use Pearl for almost every module that we have at work. And it's wow. worked really fine. And yeah, I yeah. don't know why you're picking Pearl as a language to attack. It's a really old language. It's also every language that we can pick that has problems. But it doesn't mean this has to die or stop using it. You're so right. I don't know why. You're right, you're right. First of all, you're, you're completely right. Because a language shouldn't die, it should improve. C got criticized and it improved. PHP got criticized and it improved. Why can't Perl be criticized too? Why, why is it like a cult when you say something bad about Perl, then, I don't know, a herd of Perl monks jumps on you? Why don't improve the language? Don't use it in your walk, though. It's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> then we're going to jump Thanks. over to five, please. Hi. Um, I'm not a Perl developer, but I use a lot of uh, Ruby and Python. Is this really limited to Perl, or does this apply to more or less any dynamic language? Uh, as I said in the, one of the first few slides, some of it also uh, applies to Python, specifically the, the thing when you can't specify what data types your, argument, your function arguments can get. But what's unique to Perl is that Writing different code for different data types in one function is very, very common. You can do it in every language, of course, but it is very common only in Perl. And that's what's unique about it. Of course, besides the thing that hashes and errors are, are secure. That's, that's of course, Perl, Perl's only fault. Good, then we're gonna go over to six, please. Hey. Um, did you say rat more while preparing this talk or while holding it? Hmm. Both. <laughs> did, did I rent? That was the, right? Can you? Did you say it more while preparing it or while holding it? I'm missing your word, man. Can you? Ah, what? What? Wow. Yeah, both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, do we have another from the internet? Does your exploit uh, also work in tainted mode? Uh, no, I believe not. No, it doesn't. And another one. Is there any Perl obfuf obfuf uh, obfuscated code exploits like this for a catalyst or a motrolicious? <laughs> I have no idea, man, maybe. I didn't check it, of course. I didn't check every module for every exploit I ever want to create, but uh, on, on CGIPM, which is, again, the most popular CGI library, it did. So maybe the internet can find more exploits. 
I know it, I know it can. Bring it on. That's it? That's it? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.